Hey everyone, welcome back to another video on building this amp. So in this video, pretty exciting, we finally got some sound out of the amp. Um, you can check that out at the end. But for those of us more technically curious, we'll jump into um, probing the signal as we go through the amp from the input to the output to see how that waveform changes. Um, I'll talk about some of the tweaks I've made. Um, I probably will do another version of this board just to make the other four easier to assemble. And yeah, a couple of you actually asked about um, the PCBs I made, not for this microphone, but the C12. Um, I do have, I only ordered five originally, so I do have three left. Um, and I think they're all spoken for. Somebody wanted two and there was another person that wanted one. So I'll, I'll contact those people, get those shipped out. Um, yeah, thanks for supporting me. All right, so we'll start um, with the schematic. So I showed this in another video, but we'll quickly go through the areas that I probed. Before I do that, I want to comment um, this region right here on the power supply. So this area actually had a big mistake in it when I was first building the amp. I kept blowing fuses, basically getting a dead short. Uh, nothing got damaged, but I was kind of curious, like, why was this happening? I made a big mistake here. So if you look at C27, C28, those are, one, polarized capacitors, and two, a pretty significant value, 33 microfarads. And they're before the rectification. So what those are actually doing in this incorrect configuration are the 120 wall voltage comes in, through the primaries of the power transformer. These three taps here are the secondaries, the high voltage secondaries. And I'm giving that AC power essentially a short, a path to ground. The only reason these are here are if you look at older Marshall schematics, they did have capacitors here. They were film capacitors, they were not polarized, and they were not 33 microfarads. They were much, much smaller, um, maybe 0.1 microfarads you know, 100 nanofarads. And they were only there to act as a sort of EMI suppression um, from the the switching action on the diodes. Uh, I don't fully understand, you know, why they put them before the rectification, um, but I'm not going to use them in my amp. So these have been removed, and when it's removed, everything's healthy. Uh, the only other thing I might look into is doubling up some capacitors on the filtering because I want to make sure that I have caps that are that can handle the high voltage. Right now, I think my caps are rated for 450 volts, and depending on when the circuit's loaded or unloaded, they can see significantly higher voltages than that. So I don't want those caps to see um, something that'd be out of their spec. But yeah, other than that, uh, C27, C28 are removed. Get those out of there. Um, if you're gonna keep them in, go with the Marshall spec where you have uh, non-polarized caps that are significantly lower in value. But I'm pretty sure if you read online, you really don't need those caps. They were kind of solving a problem that isn't really a problem. All right, so the first spot that we're going to probe will just be the input. Uh, we'll look at what the input signal is. And then I'll probe in between C3 and R5. And I'm essentially checking, did this first tube do its job and amplify that input signal? So what I did, um, just so it's easier for everyone to see, I have a Keysight oscilloscope where you can insert a USB thumb drive and I can save binary data to that thumb drive of the scope traces. Um, it's really easy to import that binary file into Python and plot it using Plotly just in a normal browser. So that's what we're gonna look at here. It's way cleaner to look at than a, a scope shot through another camera. So what we see is essentially that first probe where I'm going between C3 and R5. Purple is the input. We're way down at, I think, 200 millivolts input. And we can see after that first tube, we've got this green waveform. It's perfectly out of phase, which makes sense. We're doing, you know, one stage of amplification. So there's an inversion there. And we've got quite a bit of gain. We're at like plus minus eight volts. Um, so everything's healthy there. The signal looks okay. The next area that I'm going to probe 
is going to be in between R5 and R6. So we just probed in between C3 and R5, and when we go down past R5, we expect it to be pretty much the same signal, but it's a voltage divider, right? So we calculated you know, a big drop in voltage, minus 18 dB in volume. So we expect to kind of see the same thing, but just lower in amplitude. So here's the plot for the voltage divider. And in blue, we can see our original input, which is that 200 millivolt peak to peak signal. And now after that voltage divider, right, we were at plus or minus eight, and now it's pretty much the same signal. We're just back down at plus or minus one again. So we've got all the gain and character of that first tube, but now we've knocked it back down again so we can hit another stage of amplification and tone shaping after that. So we've verified the input. We've probed um, between C3 and R5, and then we checked out that voltage divider. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm leaving the um, all the switches sort of in their center position, which is disengaged. So the low three-way switch is disengaged. The pr first bright switch is disengaged. Um, later on, the second bright switch is disengaged. All my potentiometers, I essentially set to um, halfway, a noon position, just to make sure everything's good. So the next spot that I wanna check out is gonna be between C8 and the third terminal of the volume two pot. So let's check out that plot. So here's the plot from C8 to the second volume, uh, third terminal. The red plot, which we can barely see, it looks like a straight line, that's our original input sine wave, the 200 millivolts. And now we have this really interesting asymmetric clipped um, amplified signal, right? So we're going up to about 35 volts and we're going down to almost minus 50. That signal is always present on that volume two pot. And depending on where the user sets it, that's essentially setting the final output of this massive signal, right? It's almost plus minus 50 volts. But what's interesting is we've hit two tubes already. So our sine wave, it's been inverted twice. We're back into the correct polarity, but we got all this asymmetric um, clipping going on from the tube. It's not hard clipping as you can see, so there's, it's still gonna be fairly musical. It's not gonna be totally you know, fuzz pedal. But this is where the character comes from of the amp. And that's essentially why I have those early on switches for the bass and the first bright switch because it's really crucial to get your tone, sa tone shaping done there even before the tone stack. All right, the next spot that we're gonna check out on the amp, um, not too far away, we're just gonna check out volume two the second terminal. So this is where the user can set how much of that signal they want to come through and go on to um, the grid of the following triode. So let's look at that signal in comparison to the output signal and this will be for that volume pot at a noon or halfway position. So once again, kind of like that voltage divider, we knocked down that almost 50 volt peak to peak signal back down to plus minus 1.5 volts. So in blue, we have our original input signal, and now in orange, we have the output of volume two. Um, you'll notice that the clipping is also sort of different, right? So just going through a passive component like a resistive potentiometer um, does have some loading effects and can change the shape of that waveform significantly. But now we're back down into a, a more usable region before we go on to more amplification. All right, so up to this point, we've been through three triodes, um, our first two tubes. Now we're going to probe uh, right between C10 and R12. This is where bright switch two is located. It's also in the off position, the center. And we should see another really big signal here. So between C10 and R12. Between C10 and R12, our input signal unchanged, looks like a flat line almost because we have so much gain. Now we're about plus minus 25 volts and we're back to sort of a symmetrical region, um, but there's definitely you know some distortion happening. This is not a pure sinusoid tone anymore. Um, the original input signal, if you're trying to guess the um, time scale down at the bottom. It was a 400 hertz signal. I typically like to use 400 hertz um, instead of one kilohertz because usually when I'm dialing in an amp, I'm, I'm 
more careful on how it's handling those low mids because that matters more to me than anything that's more piercing up in the one kilohertz. So after C10 and R12, we hit another one of those voltage dividers where we knock it down by 18 dB. We can check out that plot too. And here we are between R12 and R13. So what's interesting is we did knock down the voltage. Um, we can see our original input signal in red. That's unchanged. We're now back out of phase with that as we were in the previous plot because um, we've been through an odd number of tube stages. So the, the polarity's flipped again. But what's interesting here is that our essentially symmetry about zero is not symmetrical, right? We've only got about half a volt in the positive direction, but we're going all the way down to minus 3.5 volts in the negative direction. So the next spot that we're going to probe is gonna be right here on R16. This is essentially what feeds into the tone stack. And you'll notice in all the previous stages, right, we've been capacitively coupling off the plate. So the plate has the high voltage on there, that big DC pedestal offset. And then we use a capacitor to remove that and send it back down into the grid of the next stage. In this case, once we hit that third tube, we go right from the plate, which has a really high voltage on it, into the grid of the next triode. And instead of coming off the plate again, we're actually gonna pull it from the cathode here. So let's check out the plot feeding into the tone stack at R16. So in yellow down here, it looks like almost a straight line. That's our original input signal, the still uh, 200 millivolt amplitude. These two signals, although it's hard to see, they are in phase. And you might be wondering, why are we sending such a massive signal into our tone stack? Well, it's a passive tone stack. So if we send in this much signal and we've got I don't know, 20, 30 dB of loss, it's okay because we sent in something that was quite large. So everything's been healthy up to this point. We've uh, probed all the way up to the phase inverter, essentially. We've got to the tone stack, and we know that we have good signals all the way up to there, so that's great. Um, the last thing to check, let's just kind of jump ahead and check on our output jack if we've got signal there. So I'll come way over here. And it's not explicitly shown, but um, the output secondaries, right, those go to a switch that we can let the user choose which impedance they want. And then from there, they go to the set of cliff jacks on the back of the amp. So I'll just probe that output there, and then we can compare it to the input. All right, so here is the final output. This is with the base switch at off in the center position, both bright switches in the center position off, both volumes at noon, and then treble mid bass at noon, and also the presence pot at noon. So this is like the de facto noon standard test. We sent in this lime green signal, this 400 hertz um, sine wave with 200 millivolts amplitude. And on the output of our amplifier after going through all that stuff, we have an out of phase signal that is significantly not a sine wave, it's almost more a square wave, although there are no hard edges, which is interesting. And we've got some gain compared to that input, right? We're around almost 1.5 volts plus minus, and it's nicely centered around that, right? Because we've come out of that uh, output transformer. Even though this looks like a fairly small signal, right? Plus minus 1.5 volts for the volume being at half, we have to remember that that volume pot is logarithmic. So as we get closer to bringing that wide open, this voltage signal is gonna get significantly bigger. And with that voltage, it still has the current capability and that's where we essentially increase the overall wattage of the amp. So we've probed the signal. We know everything's good with a sine wave. So now it's time to unplug that sine wave and we can plug in a guitar. Uh, this next little video I'll show is essentially me just jamming through the guitar. It's not mic'd up, it's just camera audio, but I think it's exactly the type of sound I was going for with this amplifier. Um, everything's still at noon. I really don't touch the potentiometers. Um, the, well, the volume's knocked back down again. I think I'm only at uh, nine o'clock on the master volume there, the volume one, which is the second volume. But you'll see um, on the left that I do start to play with the switches, the bass switch and the two treble switches, and you can here are some pretty cool tonal differences um, just playing with those switches there. 
I'm really pleased with how low noise it is. When I stop playing and I'm on a humbucker and you know you account for the pickup noise, it's pretty much dead quiet, which is just what I wanted. Um, my original amp that this was modeled after, I did it so hurriedly and everything was you know kind of sloppy point to point that the tone was there, but it had a pretty bad noise problem. And I think doing everything, um, taking my time with the PCB, getting every, all the grounding right, and especially the layout of these three chunks of iron down at the bottom, right? The power transformer, the choke in between, and then the output transformer. That like significantly helped lower the noise floor. So um, even though I have AC heaters, I'm not hearing that noise. I've got the twisted pair, so those should be canceling each other magnetically. And yeah, I think I'm, I'm super pleased with how things are sounding. So let me know what you think of the sound. And I'll have to next design a front panel. Um, I've got the chassis from the, the woodworker guy. So I'll have to install the rack rails there and get things to fit. But um, all in all, we've got sound and it sounds killer and it's exactly what I was going for. So next steps are to make it look like a, a finished amplifier. Thanks for watching.